Hey, good morning. Welcome. Come on in. I'm Andy Lee, and this is the Bite of Bread. Come on in. Get your coffee, get your Bibles, and your journal, and let's dig deep. Today, we're studying about our identity in Christ, and what that means, and who we are, and the freedom it gives us. And we're going to stop trying to be good because we don't have to anymore because of Jesus. Anyway, ah, we need to pray a lot before we get started today that we could receive this truth. Venus, good morning, Debbie Johnson. Good morning. I got my coffee with my mug, but I just need mascara and caffeine. A lot of it today. It's a cloudy, rainy day in Wilmington, and hopefully this broadcast will not be... Um, messed up too much from, from the rain, but sometimes it interferes. Hi, Elaine. Good to see you. Barbara, good morning. I miss you. Good to see you. Steve, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Robin, good to see you. Okay, y'all ready to pray? We're going to hold our hands and pray us up and get us ready to receive this word. Hi, Ellen. Good morning. Okay, so hold my hands. We're going to pray. Father, we love you and praise you and worship you. And we thank you that you are our Father God who loves us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. And Lord, I just pray that this truth will become clearer to us today. Lord, we know these scriptures. Many of us know the scripture. Um, we've stepped out in faith, but you are taking us every day a little bit deeper, a little bit closer to understanding truth, freeing us more and more. And so I pray today for freedom in Jesus' name. I pray for clarity of the power of the cross in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that we would claim our identity. We would get that a little bit more so that we could walk in the victory and the power and the purpose that you have for us and all that um, you did for us to walk in that, to be kingdom people, to bring light in this dark place. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, Beth Francis, Linda, good to see you. Come on in. I think a lot of y'all came in with my eyes closed. So welcome. So glad you're here. Go with me. Get your Bibles and open them up to Romans 8, verse 1. So Romans 8 is like one of my favorite chapters Ever. I mean, I think we could just camp out in Romans 8 for months and learn so much. But one thing about Romans 8, and especially verse 1, is that it's a very familiar verse. And a lot of times, the verses we know and we love so much, they're so familiar to us that we just say them and we take, you know, we take what we've learned from them. But because they're so familiar, we are missing some of the truth in it. We just keep on reading. Hey, Deb Warren, good morning. Glad you could be with me this morning. So turn with me to Romans 8, 1. If you can read it out loud with me, I'm reading from the NIV version. And if you have another version that has something else besides the word condemnation, will you please type that into the um into the comments but in, in romans 8 1 if you want to read with me paul writes therefore that there, there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus because through christ jesus the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death Hey, Aaron, good morning. I'm glad you could join me. Amen. So that was Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, condemnation, that word, and I've taught on this scripture many times, and I've told you that I have, I have experienced condemnation from 
people and judgment from others and that condemnation has been and even though it was well intended <laughs> the person who I experienced this with I think they meant well but ooh, it was just heavy and oppressive and I knew something wasn't right but when when God convicts me that I feel freedom because he shows me and then he empowers me <laughs> this healing I can't explain it it's supernatural it's one of those things if you've experienced God's healing conviction his freedom from convicting you of maybe idolatry of somebody you've put up on on a throne that's what I had done I was I was trusting others um, more than the Holy Spirit in me so that was a conviction that he showed me that freed me hi Marion good morning Lori come on in Sam good morning glad you could be here so if you've experienced that if you've experienced the oppression of condemnation and the freedom of conviction just say amen or yeah me too I felt that put that in there so the word condemnation here is in the Greek I'm going to try to pronounce it let me spell it for you first k-a-t-a-k-r-i-m-a -A. so katakrima Catacrima is my best pronunciation for it today. So catacrima means a decision against someone. Judgment for punishment. So there's now no, there's no decision against you. No judgment against you for punishment. There's now no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus we are not condemned we are not going to be judged to be punished um, there's not a decision against us for those who are in Christ Jesus the words uh, um, his name Christ Jesus I love this Christ means the anointed one hi Dana good morning and Kara good morning the name Christ means the Messiah, means the anointed one. Don't you remember how Christ was anointed by Mary of Bethany and the prostitute in the Gospel of Luke? Those women anointed him. They took the oil and they poured it over his head and it ran down his beard and they they wiped his his feet with with their well they washed his feet with their tears and wiped it with their hair <laughs> don't you know that as they anointed him and they they worshiped him and they wiped his feet with their hair that oil got on them too as they anointed Jesus he was the anointed one the anointed one was the one from the Holy Spirit was up on him for he was the Messiah and Jesus the name Jesus we get the Joshua is Hebrew of Jesus and it means God saves so Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus is the anointed God who saves don't you love that hi Terry good morning don't you love that he is the anointed God who saves that's who Jesus Christ was and is the anointed God who saves therefore there is no decision for judgment decision against us there's no judgment for those who are in the anointed one the God who saves because through the anointed God who saves the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death now the word law I think um, really we see that word law we see negative connotations we think oh the law was bad but that word law can also be translated into the instructions for living it can be in it can be um, seen as some some translate it as the Torah so the law that Moses brought in the Ten Commandments and the those and the, all of that law was instructions for living yes instructions for living also instructions of how to how to be made right with God right as they brought in the sacrifice 
as they brought in their their offerings all of those the, all of those things were instructions and they were good we look at the law as bad but the law wasn't bad the law was god's grace in the first place for the people to find a way for them to to be in his presence and to be right with him so the law was a good thing it wasn't bad in fact the law was good because the law showed that that it could not change their hearts it cannot change their hearts and that really is the key right so our hearts need changing we get so focused on our actions hi heather good morning but really it all starts with the heart and god says one day i'm going to give you a remove your heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh and i'm going to put write my laws on your heart my instruction for living the way to be right with me i'm going to write it on your heart right and so that's what he did with the law and the instruction of living of the spirit of life that word life is zoe that eternal never ending ongoing life that this is that is free from the law the instruction of living um or just the i would say even the order of things the way things needed to be the order of the sin and death that, that jesus on the cross changed all that so I wanted to read um, a little blurb that I wrote last week as we studied and we studied um, spiritual battles that that we fight. And if you go to wordsbyandylee.com, you can read last week's blog post and read this week's too if you haven't, because these are key. And so last week, really, we focused on scriptures on how we view God and, and how good he is and kind he is and how, why we can trust him and that he's working out for good. That all of this, these mindsets, these, these truths that we need to hold on to that help us, that put us in the stronghold of God during a spiritual battle in the midst of life itself, right? But this week, our mindset is, is focused on our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ. This is a huge a huge thing that will help us against those spiritual battles that we find ourselves in. Hi, Judy. Good morning. So well, I just wanted to read from last week. I was talking about the cross because, my friends, the cross changed everything. But many of us, even though we, we know about the cross, we go to church, we know about Jesus, we are still living under the law, even though we, we say, no, we aren't, no, we aren't, but I'm going to show you that we still are. But listen, the cross ushered in a new covenant of the blessing of the Holy Spirit. The old covenant was one of blessing and curses. Now, remember, God gave Moses, or Joshua, all of them, Moses, started with Moses, the Mosaic law, you obey me. You do these things, you will be blessed. You don't obey me. You don't keep God as your God. And you have idols and other gods. Then you are going to be cursed. That was the Mosaic, the Old Covenant. When Jesus came, that, that was fulfilled. It was completed. It was completed. Let me keep on reading. The Old Covenant was one of blessings and curses. If you obeyed, you were blessed. If you didn't, you were cursed. But all the curse, listen to me, all the curse, all the judgment was placed on Jesus on the cross. And it's so hard for us to understand that. It's woo. So we need Holy Spirit open up our brains today to help us understand that so it can get to our hearts. Galatians 3.13 talks of this, talks about how all of the curse was placed on Jesus. Remember, the old covenant was a covenant of blessings and curses. And so, and it was, if you, you follow me, you obey me, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be cursed. But when Jesus died on that cross, the scripture says he took all of the curse on him. All of the judgment was on him. Diana, good morning. So Galatians 3.13 
tells us that. It says, Christ redeemed us. Don't you love the word redeem? Everybody say redeem. Hallelujah. We have a redeemer. So Christ redeemed. We talked about redeem last week too. About you know something has to be purchased in order for that coupon to have value and to be used for its purpose in the first place. Otherwise, it has no purpose until it's redeemed. So we have been redeemed. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So all of that curse, all of that judgment was on Jesus. He took it for us. Therefore, there is now no judgment and judgment toward punishment or curse for those in Christ Jesus. Hi, Elizabeth. Good morning. So the curse had been fulfilled. It had been completed. It had been done. Um, John 19.30. If you want to go to John 19.30, I think Jesus... Um, some of Jesus' last words, John nineteen thirty. What were his last words? That's what John nineteen thirty is. His last words were, "It is finished." What's finished? Well, that old covenant, that old law, that blessing and cursing. It's done. It was completely fulfilled, finished, demonstrated. Some say that's what that word fulfill means. Demonstrated by God himself, by Jesus Christ, by sending his son. Now, you know what I think is interesting? God poured all of himself into a man's body and lived here on this earth. New temptation. Jesus experienced temptation, though without sin, but he had never had that before. You know, like when he was in heaven with God, he never experienced temptation. Put him in a man's body and he experienced that temptation. He knew what it was like. Everything had been completed and fulfilled on the cross. And Jesus said, it's finished. It's done. So it's been fulfilled, it's been completed, it's been done. What did Christ say when he was on the cross before that? He said, forgive them. He prayed. This was a prayer that he prayed on the cross. Forgive them, Lord, right? Forgive them. For what? Why? Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. They don't get it. Hi, Kelly. Good to see you. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, Lord. So even on the cross, Christ is fulfilling, demonstrating, showing us what that cross meant and what it was. He forgave us. He prayed. He interceded for us to be forgiven while he was taking the punishment, the judgment, the condemnation, all the curse on him on the cross. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? But Lord, we just pray. Can I pray that you just help us understand that a little bit more? See, the enemy, John 10, 10, Jesus says, the enemy has come to what? To kill and to steal and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to bring them life. And that's that Zoe life, that eternal life, that same life that we read that same word in Romans 8, the spirit of life. And he says, I've come to give them Zoe, to give them eternal life and to give it to the full, to give it all of it abundantly to them, starting now all the way to, all the way to eternity, um, that they would have that. Now, now Satan doesn't have the ability to con to condemn us or, or keep us from salvation. However, he does have the ability to keep us in shame and blame and unforgiveness and to keep us from walking out 
who we are, this victorious, shiny, salty, life-giving people. What did we see last yesterday? We saw that we are a holy nation chosen by Jesus, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And we talked about putting on our robe, putting on our royal robes and blessing those around us that with authority came this responsibility um, and that we walk in these this new purpose and it's so freeing my friends it's so freeing when it's not about us anymore but as long as the enemy can keep us from experiencing the complete freedom of this truth then we're going to keep on feeling like we have to do it. We have to try. We have to be better. We have to keep on saying, we have to, have to, have to, have to. Can I just tell you, stop trying because you can't. And Jesus has done it all. So I want to share with you, I have this dear, dear, dear friend. Her name is Kristen Allen. I don't know if she'll see this today. Kristen lives in Wisconsin. But Kristen has an anointing on her. Um, she, she's been. She knows the Lord has called her a, a preacher of righteousness, and that doesn't mean that she walks around saying, "You got to stop doing this. You got to stop doing that. You got to be right with God." No, she has this amazing anointing of the teaching of grace and the kindness and the goodness of God. And she gave me a book for my birthday called The Cure. And I haven't read all of it. So, um, but I really trust my friend and I know how she believes. And so it's called The Cure. Um, it's by John, by like three different men. So don't try to write this down. John Lynch, Bruce McNichol, and Bill Thrall are the men. But I just want to read a little bit of The Cure today um he says much of our difficulty accepting this new life has to do with the shame that we carry shame it whispers and hisses that no matter what you do you will always be defined by what you did or what was done to you it mocks you shame wants you desperately performing for acceptance you don't believe you deserve that's when we begin to form the fake God. He talks about two different gods or two different perceptions of God. That's when we begin to form the fake God. We imagine him staring at us with a thin smile and a measured nod. He has to love us. He has to love us, but he's not sure he likes us. His arms are folded. He wears an expression that says, yes, your sins are forgiven. Your ticket's punched for eternity, but don't get lazy. You've got to stop being such a slug, and don't think I missed that last wrong thought you had four minutes ago. I'm not stupid. I still keep a list. I just don't lose my temper as much. What are you staring at? Get to work. Okay, so that's one view we have of God, even though we know we're saved, right? How can we draw close to a God we imagine saying, sure, your sins are forgiven, but you're still the same failure. You had an excuse before, but not anymore. What difference does any of this make in what you and I are facing right now? Let's consider one area many struggle with, sexual sin. Almost every book on finding sexual sin focuses on how we can react better at the moment of temptation. Thousands of tips and techniques are laid out to keep us from acting out. What helpful these what while helpful these books miss the point. We didn't reach this moment randomly. We got here by gradually distorting our view of God back there. Those prevention tools made sense until we allowed ourselves to entertain a thought that would eventually lead us to crisis. The moment those safeguards are needed, it's too late. We no longer want, want them to help. We are now way past wanting to do right. The problem is actually rooted far back when our course was fundamentally altered. The problem is our distorted picture of God. That distortion is a pall over our eyes, keeping light out. The distortion is there because we believe these five things about God. Now, let's see, do you believe these things? Number one, God can't satisfy me as much as the sin. 
Number two, I've always been this way. I don't believe I'm powerful enough to change that, which we aren't. Number three, there is something fundamentally wrong with me. Number four, I don't believe God has been fully good to me. Number five, I'm going to feel like a value anyway, so I might as well enjoy it. These are the root beliefs behind the permission we give ourselves to fail. They all are formed from picturing God separated from us. At that point, it's only a matter of time, opportunity, and our particular areas of vulnerability. If we see God through a veil of shame, we'll think the goal is to fix the behavior. Shame wants us constantly trying to prove we're not as bad as we imagine. In the room of grace, however, in the room of grace, room of grace, we're learning to believe we are no longer identified by shame. Our God doesn't see us that way, and he doesn't need us to see ourselves that way. We're free to trust his delight and love, even in the midst of our erratic, maturing behaviors. He wants us to learn dependence on him instead of performance. We're learning to trust his power in us. The beauty is we actually fail less in doing so. Okay, so how do we know whether our relationship is with the God we see through our shame or the God who really is? Um, he says, uh, you'd have to ask what shame looks like in a relationship. Do I measure? Look at these Look at these questions. I think these questions are really good. Do I measure my closeness to God by how little I'm sinning or by my trust that to the exact extent that the Father loves Jesus, Jesus loves me. So do you feel like you have to measure up to God's love? Do I see myself primarily as a saved sinner or a saint who still sins? When I talk to God, do I spend more time rehearsing my failures or enjoying his presence? Am I drawn to, to severe authors and preachers who challenge me to get Serious about sin or those who encourage me to trust this new identity in me? Am I drawn to messages telling me I haven't done enough or those that remind me who I am so that I'm free to live out this life God's given me? Do I trust disciplines to make me strong or grace to strengthen me? Do I believe that God is not interested in changing me because he already has? Oh, listen, can I read that one again? Do I believe that God is not interested in changing me because he already has somebody give me an amen? Did you know you're already changed? Do I read the Bible as you ought, you should, why can't you, when will you, or as you can? This is who you are now. Oh, I love that. Love that. Oh, I'm going to... Okay. And then he talks about a caterpillar. And I'm going to close um, with this part. The, nature provides many examples of this incredible discrepancy between who we appear to be and who we truly are. Consider <laughs> the caterpillar. If we brought a caterpillar to a biologist and ask him to analyze it and describe its DNA, he would tell us, I know this looks like a caterpillar to you. But scientifically, according to every test, including DNA, this is fully and completely a butterfly. Wow. God is wired into a creature looking nothing like a butterfly, a perfectly So, I'm sorry. He has wired into a creature looking nothing like a butterfly, a perfectly complete butterfly identity. And because the caterpillar is a butterfly, in essence, it will one day display the behavior and attributes of a butterfly. <laughs> I'm going to cry. The caterpillar matures into what is already true about it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? In the meantime, 
But writing the caterpillar for not being more like a butterfly is not only futile, it will probably hurt its tiny ears. So it is with us. God has given us the DNA of righteousness. We are saints. Nothing we do will make us more righteous than we already are. Nothing we do will alter this reality. God knows our DNA. He knows that we are Christ in me. And now he is asking us to join him in what he knows is true. Amen. I love that. There's now no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life Zoe, eternal life, has set me free from the law of sin and death. Whenever you think that shame, for, that shame comes in, when that wants to come and get you and hold you down, you just repeat, uh-uh, uh-uh. I have the law of the spirit of life inside of me, and it has set me free from the law of sin and death. I am a butterfly. Another great, great book to read to help us understand this is Unashamed by Christine Kane. How many of you have read this book? Um, a powerful book. She talks about the shame that goes back, way back in her life. Um, it started in kindergarten and then it go, went back even farther as she realized that she was adopted and on her birth certificate, it, she did not have the name of the mother, nor was she a named child. She didn't have a name. But she says, hurt people hurt people, and broken people break people, and shattered people shatter people, and damaged people damage people, and wounded people wound people, and bound people bind people, right? But she says, this, I believe, is where so many of us suffer from shame. We get stuck in the wilderness. We feel that painful gap between what we know should be going on inside of us, love, forgiveness, kindness, joy, patience, peace, and so on, and what is actually going on in us, anger, blame, impatience, jealousy, turmoil, judgment, suspicion, and so on. So she talks about the fact that she had started a ministry, and yet she still had all of these issues and all of these troubles and all of her shame buttons would be pushed and finally someone called her out on it and it was such a freeing moment because then it was released and freed a confession of yeah this is something i struggle with and there was freedom there she says after joanne came to me i got personal with god I talked with him about my scariest, ugliest thoughts, feelings, and memories. I chose to be vulnerable. Something shame teaches us not to do and to seek counsel and accountability from seasoned, trustworthy mentors. If you struggle with shame, if you struggle with a sin that you just can't let go of, share with a, a, a confidant, with a mentor, with someone who will pray with you and hold your hand when it's out of the darkness. My friends, the light will kill it. It'll be free. It'll be free. She said, um, when I did, God began to cut through my thick, hardened defense mechanisms. I began moving from deliverance to freedom in this area, from the wilderness to the promised land. And she talks about it not being easy. But just to allow the Lord to start healing your heart by faith. She said, when I did, my faith, my strength, and my courage arose. And she said, her people hurt people, but helped people help people. Broken people break people, but rebuilt people build people. Shattered people shatter people, but whole people restore people damage people damage people but loved people love people and heal people bind up wounds and freed people lead others to freedom isaiah 61 and just gotta go back there and then that's where we're going to close today my friends this is yours this is your dna
we have accepted Christ on the cross, all of our condemnation, all of the judgment for sin was taken by Christ. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. The Sovereign Lord is on me and he's on you. Hannah, good morning. He's on you. Because the Lord Yahweh has anointed me. He had anointed Jesus to do this. And now as we have the Holy Spirit of Christ inside of us, we are anointed to do this too. To preach the good news. Oh, Andy, I can't preach the good news. My friends, just share your testimony. That is the good news of what Jesus has done. To share the testimony. To preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Only us who have had our, our hearts bound up. Do we really, are we able to minister to the brokenhearted? To proclaim freedom for the captives. Any of you one time were you captive? But now you can proclaim freedom and you can share that with those around you. To release darkness from the prisoners. To proclaim a year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And the and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. What are you walking in today? I pray that this scripture can go from here down to here. That you are loved. That you are called. That you are chosen. That you are free. That you no longer have punishment and judgment on you. That in Christ we are being healed, restored, and given purpose to spread that kingdom, identity, and truth to those around us. Good stuff. Hold my hands. Let me pray you up. Jesus, we thank you for this word. We thank you that there is now no judgment for those in Christ Jesus, that we are free. We are free. We are free to, to be loved by you. We are free to love others, we are free to walk in victory. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I do pray for a deeper understanding um, and reality of your tangible love for us and what this scripture means. It's in Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. Come back tomorrow. We're going to be um, in Galatians 3, 28 through 29. Mm, it's a good, it's another good one. So come back as we study who we are in Christ, what that means and what that looks like. Bev says freedom. Amen. Amen. Um, go to wordsbyindylee.com and you can get the Bible reading plan for this week and extra um, prompts and questions. It's a free printable you can get. You can go to YouTube and watch this again and leave a comment and send it to friends. Send it to anybody who you know needs this freedom and this wholeness in Jesus. Hey, Linda, good to see you today. Y'all have a great day. Go out there. Be a threat to the enemy by walking in who you are as a Christian, as a believer of Jesus, the God who saves. We'll see you later. Bye.